chapter on this, the series of parables. And Nick introduced it last week, giving us a bit about the background of parables, why Jesus used parables. Um, but then, um, so if you missed it, like do go check it out online. All our messages appear on our website and YouTube. So if you know someone who appreciates them, do let them know. Um, now, Nick opened with quite an amusing story last week. I will not do the same because I don't like to embarrass myself on stage. Um, but um, <laughs> we're, we're looking at the parable of the persistent widow this uh, morning. And when I was thinking about it, it just kind of reminded me of my kids. And I'm pretty sure that every parent in the room can relate to this. When their kid comes to them and goes, can I please... X, Y, and Z, and you're like, no, not today, or no, or whatever the answer is, it's normally a no. And then they're like, please, please, please. And they whine at you, whine at you, thinking that you're going to change your mind. Now, my kids were slightly unfortunate to be born to me, and I have a very stubborn streak. So when they do that, whereas if they'd left me a bit of space, sometimes I might have changed my mind, but now they've just gone and just pushed me over the edge. So I'm like, Nope, you're done. You're never going to whine your way <laughs> into me showing you favor. And um, I'm like, has that ever worked for you, kid? And they're like, no. And I'm like, so why are we here? Um, uh, <laughs> but thankfully, thankfully, we serve a God <laughs> who's far more gracious and merciful than I am as a parent. And he acts with justice and as Belinda was talking about, with mercy on our lives. And um, and as we look at this parable this morning and we look at a bit of the fuller context of it, and what's written around it, there's this challenge, this encouragement and this invitation to step into the work God is doing and the story that God is writing. And before I really dig in, I just want to pray before we start. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come before you in praise and worship this morning and just learn more of who you are. Lord, will you just open our hearts and our minds this morning? May you make us like clay, that we can be molded by your spirit. Lord, will you just anoint my words? May it go forth, Lord Jesus, with your spirit and your power, that we may be drawn closer to you this morning. Come by your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So the parable of the persistent widow can be found in Luke 18. So if you have your Bible in any form, phone, physical, whatever you might have, can I encourage you to read along with me? Um, we're going to be reading Luke 18 verses 1 to 8. And it says this, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? It's interesting because uh, sometimes, as Nick was saying last week when he was introducing parables, the meaning of the parables aren't always instantly clear, and, go, and Jesus has to go on and explain them. However, we find right at the beginning of this parable that Jesus taught, and it says, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. So there you go. That's the lesson for today. I won't sit down. It is tempting, but I won't. Um, so we're going to unpack that a bit this morning in the light of the widow and the judge, as well as some of that wider context around the passage. So I'm actually just going to jump. I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to kind of skip over it. But in um, Luke chapter 17, we find the Pharisees are asking Jesus when the kingdom of God will come. And Jesus gives them an answer, which can be quite cryptic, but also can feel a little bit demoralizing by the end. The main answer being that we won't know when Jesus is coming again and when it does, but when it does, we will know. And it ends by saying that one will be taken and the person next to them won't be. 
where are they taken? Is the question asked at the end of chapter 17. And the response from Jesus is, where the corpse is, there, there the vultures will gather. And I was like, yay, thanks, Jesus. Um, so it kind of ends on this kind of weird note. And yet the very next thing Jesus says is shares this parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And it can be easy to look around us and we can see all sorts of things happening. And, and we know that they're not how God kind of desires for the world to work or how he wants people living. And in this chapter 17 passage that I was referring to, it also refers to the times of Noah and the flood and the city of Sodom. And it's the times in the Old Testament where it's known that people weren't living for, for God in his ways. And then we look at the conditions that the world is in now and it's not that dissimilar. And as we read through the Bible, we see the consequences of those ungodly lives, the flood, cities were destroyed. But here we have a parable that Jesus shares so that we don't lose hope, so that we know how important it is to keep on praying. Jesus gives this stark reality in chapter 17 of who's going to make it into the kingdom and who isn't. But there's hope and it's prayer. Prayer is a central tool that God has given us to remain close to him so that we will be ready to see Jesus come again. So here in Luke 18, we find this judge and he clearly states that he neither fears God or respects man. This man does not come across as the kind of man that you really want to be pleading your case to. It feels like he would just make whatever choice he fancied on that day, whether he judged you worthy or more likely not. And he probably wouldn't lose sleep over the consequences of that judgment. And then we have this widow. You know, widows at this time really had no resources. They were pretty lowly in society. They, their lives were a struggle. And I can't imagine the amount of courage it would have taken this widow to come before a judge, let alone a judge that we see here described as really not really caring about people. But even in her life of struggle, she comes in desperate need of help and needs justice doing on her behalf. But she doesn't just come once, she keeps on coming. We're not told how many times that was, but it was enough to wear this judge down this judge that had a little regard for people. The only reason the judge provides justice in this situation is because he doesn't want the bother anymore. He's done listening to this case. He just wants it off his docket. And sometimes we can mistakenly think that that's how God treats us. That we see ourselves as this widow so far down the food chain that really we don't deserve to have our case heard by God. Or sometimes we take our own justice into our own hands instead of our righteous, just God who wants to do it on our behalf. And what we find in this parable is that the judge is in direct contrast to who our Heavenly Father is. In verses six to eight, it says this, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. So what do we learn of God here? God brings justice to the elect, to those who follow him and have him as their Lord and savior. He does not delay this is the character of God. He is just and he responds to our prayers. But there's a challenge here. What about our prayers? How would we categorize or how would you or how would we categorize our prayer lives right now? The widow came before the judge with passion, with a sense of urgency, with a real sense of need. And she wasn't going anywhere until he gave her an answer. Is this how we pray? Are we persistent? I looked up the dictionary definition of persistent because I like to do those kinds of things. And they, <laughs> they, it's described as continuing firmly or obstinately 
in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition, or continuing to exist or endure over a prolonged period. So are we truly persistent in our prayers? Or do we give up when it gets hard? Or we don't see what we think should be happening right before our eyes. You know, it would have been so easy for the widow to walk away after the first time of encountering this judge. she just gone, well, I knew that was going to be the case and just give up right there. But she didn't. She kept on coming. And the thing here is, that as I already pointed out, the judge is not God. And we have so many more reasons to keep on coming and keep on crying out to God. Verse 7 says, And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? It can feel a little uncomfortable at times when we say that because what this is saying is as his elect, as his people, as people who believe in God and walk with Jesus, we should be crying out day and night. We are to have passion, to have faith, to have hope for what we're believing for, for what we're praying for. Psalm 37 reminds us that we don't need to bring justice about for ourselves. That is not our job. God will do it. And verses one, verses one to seven of Psalm 37 say this, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. God promises justice and he promises to act on our behalf. But what does it say that we need to do? In this psalm, it says that we need to trust God, do good, dwell in the land, befriend faithfulness, delight in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord, be still, wait patiently. Those are hard. <laughs> And right in the middle of these verses, it says that God will give you the desires of your heart. Does this mean we can come and ask God for anything? We can, but it doesn't mean that we'll get what we desire. God is not an ATM machine. Our relationship with God is not transactional. It's built on love, trust, and faith. And I think too often we come to God when we're in trouble in that crisis moment and we've actually forgotten that what he desires most from us is relationship. So when we come to him in times of trouble, will he hear us and act? Absolutely. Because God is full of grace, mercy, and love. It abounds. But we miss out when we don't come to God all the time. We miss out on that intimate, close relationship that God is longing to walk with us. And as we spend that time, as we become close and intimate with God, our heart shifts. And when we're committing our ways to him, when we're trusting him, when we're dwelling with him, our hearts then align with his. So when we pray, those desires that are in our hearts are fulfilled. And we get the privilege of seeing his hand move in our lives and on behalf of others. You know, when we spend time praying, we learn what the will of God is. And we start praying with this in mind. 1 John 5, 14 says this, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Our heavenly father knows what is best for us. He will give to us all that we desire when we're walking in relationship with him and our ways come into line with his and I said, and as I said before, it doesn't mean that he won't answer us if we've messed up or we feel distant. It just means that we get the opportunity to enter into this free flowing grace when we call upon his name about things that are close to his heart. And when we're seeking the purposes he has for us and for those around us, 
Prayer is our invitation to enter into what God is already doing. And we get to be part of that conversation. We get to learn what the will of God is and frame our prayers around it. Which means we better understand that God's no is still an answer. And his no leads to a better yes. And if we're struggling to determine what that will of God is in our lives, his word says that he will help us. Romans 8, 26 says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. This points to the word that I had the other week, to show up. That when we show up, when we pray, when we spend time with Jesus, we might not have the words, we might not even know what to do. But God is right there waiting for us if we just show up. He will show us. He will speak to us. I'm going to be giving a bit more of a practical guideline towards the end of my sermon to help us if um, we're not sure where to begin with prayer or it feels daunting or we're kind of out of the habit. Um, But in Luke 18, it says that the very purpose of this parable is to encourage us to always pray. And I've said before, it means not just coming in crisis. It means being in this constant conversation and relationship with Jesus. And there's this famous quote from Smith Wigglesworth that says this, I don't often spend more than half an hour in prayer, but I never go more than half an hour without praying. And I love that picture that that creates because it's this constant dialogue in our life, always seeking out the Father, always listening for what the Father wants to say. The persistent widow in our parable today kept on coming back to the judge. She kept on pleading her case. Her passion and focus were raw and real. This mattered to her. She put the time in. She put the effort in. She made this issue a priority in her life. You know, what are our priorities? What are we battling in prayer for right now? Are we putting that time in? And it's not that God will only answer our prayers if we put the time in, but there is something about praying with passion and faith that moves the heart of God, that brings our heart into alignment, that makes heaven touch earth and we see things shift. The last line of this parable is this, nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? What a challenge. I just feel like well, as soon as I've read it before and then I read it again when I was preparing and I was like, it kind of just felt like a bit of a soccer punch, you know, like when it's like, okay. And I don't know where you're at, but it really stirs me to ensure that when Jesus comes again, he finds faith. And whether that's, whether Jesus coming again is my lifetime or not, or whether I'm praying and investing in the generations to come so that they're ready for when Jesus lands back on earth. Jesus is coming. We've always been in the end times. It feels very end times right now. We don't know when it's coming, but it's coming. And we need to be ready. We need to be praying for our own faith. We need to be praying for our children's faith. We need to be praying for our community's faith, this country's faith this world's faith. We need to be praying. And I believe that God is stirring up his church. He's calling it to rise. He's calling it into prayer and worship. The world needs Jesus. And we need to be crying out for it on its behalf and on our own behalf. We need to be a people passionate about the people who don't know Jesus yet, who aren't saved, who don't know what it is to walk in the glory of God. I keep crying out to God for better and more effective strategies to reach the people of South Surrey and White Rock so that they can can come to know Jesus for themselves. And I believe that he has, and he will continue to show us those tangible, practical things that we can do as a church. But when it comes down to it, it comes down to prayer. Are we hungry for the kingdom of God? Does our prayer life reflect that hunger? Could we as a people be described as persistent prayers? 
Are we hungry for the things that God has put on our heart to pray for? How hungry are we really, church? The widow had nothing and came before a judge who couldn't care less. Yet she was hungry and kept on coming. We have a loving, merciful Father God who is full of grace, who has given us every spiritual blessing under the heavens. But are we coming to our Father hungry? Are we coming to our Father full of faith and trust that he will move on our behalf, on our community's behalf, on our country's behalf? Or have we lost or have we ever had the hunger that this widow had to be persistent, to be committed, to be faithful, to keep on coming despite the cost, despite the apparent view that nothing was changing. And I believe that this is the center of what God wanted me to say this morning. So if there's only one thing you remember this morning, it's this, that God is calling us to be a people who are hungry, really hungry, to see God move and that hunger get satisfied only through prayer. And I know that there are people who have been praying for years for things, for healing, for loved ones, for breakthrough in all sorts of areas in their lives and in those around them. And it's hard and you can be walking daily in pain in all sorts of ways. But our only responsibility before God is to lift these things in prayer, to delight in him, to commit our ways to him. Be still before him and wait for him. For he is working on your behalf, our behalf. He is moving for those around you. Pray and don't lose heart. It's not easy but the outcome is not our responsibility. It's God's. You know, but we also need to be ready for the answer. And that might seem like a slightly odd space to step into. But are there requests that we've given up on or even forgotten? We've prayed them. We've believed for them. And they well may have truly been in the will of God. But we've stopped praying. We've dropped those requests and we may not be ready for the answer that God always had coming. And I don't want to miss what God wants to do because I stopped praying or having faith for something that he put on my heart. And I believe that God wants to do a work here in South Surrey and White Rock. And I believe that he's called Numa Church to be part of that. But if we stop praying and we stop believing and we stop having faith, he'll still answer those faithful prayers. It just might not include us. Is Jesus going to come and not find faith for what he placed on our hearts? Zechariah and Elizabeth, I have no doubt, prayed for a baby when they were of baby bearing age. And I suspect that they prayed hard and they prayed with faith. Many years passed. I don't know, maybe they, I kind of suspect they'd stop praying for it. And then one day, while Zechariah was just minding his own business, doing his job as a priest, an angel appears to him and says, Elizabeth is going to bear a child. Zechariah's response in that moment was, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. It's a nice little musical interlude there. I don't know where it's coming from, but... <laughs> It's the uh, theatre. Could uh, oh yeah, Belinda, can you just go and ask them to uh, remind them that they have a church running in screen one? That would be awesome. Um, I will just take a pause because I think it's important that we hear what God wants to say and not the cinema's advertisements. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Awesome. Oh no, it was just a break in the advert. I love it. They are. It's because Jesus wants to speak, people. This is my uh, theory on this. This is an important message that we need to hear. And I don't say that arrogantly from me. I say it from God. Um, 
Yes, there are lots of distractions when we pray. That's very relevant, Naomi. And this is those moments where it's like God has something to say. And this could be a while because they've probably got to run upstairs somewhere. Oh, no, I think that was it. Yes, awesome. Anyway, back to Zechariah's response. So here we have Zechariah who had prayed probably fervently for years for this baby. And then his response to the angel is this, how shall I know this for I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years? The answer to his prayer had come, but Zechariah wasn't ready for it. And he walked through this season mute as a result. I think his, his response is understandable and his position understandable. We've all been there and we can all relate to it. But I think Jesus is challenging us in this parable. Do we have faith for the things we are and have prayed for in our lives? And are we persistent in praying them? I think too often we expect God to answer our prayers instantly and particularly not necessarily even that, but in our own timeline. And so I've got lost. <laughs> and, you know, if we have a God who always answers our prayers instantly, we wouldn't need to be like this persistent widow coming back to God coming back with the same prayer request time and time again. But I believe that there are times that God will answer slowly, that he's slow in revealing his answer. And I believe it's because slow answered prayers build relationship, faith, and trust in him. If God answered when and how we wanted, would relationship, trust, and faith be built? Would we mature and grow in our relationship with God? I think the answer is no. And because that is the main thing that God wants for us is this relationship with him, walking closely with him, keeping short account with him. He will sometimes slow that timeline down. But I love how Mark said, God isn't late. God is never late into your life. We just need to be ready. We just need to be persistent and we need to be faithful. And as children of God, we have the right and ability to ask for anything and everything. Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. But again, back to 1 John 5, 14, it's in his will. And that's the key here, acknowledging God, praying in his will. And you know what? Until God tells you to stop praying for something, you keep praying. You keep going back. We may never even see the answer with our own eyes this side of heaven. But God will move on our behalf. Our prayers rise like incense before God, and then they reach into eternity. And only then will we see the full fruit of what our prayer lives has produced. You know, God has gifted us this gift of prayer this powerful and effective tool to enable us to walk through life in his strength and his power. Jesus went to the cross to enable this communication method. He went to the cross so that we could be in relationship with our Father God, so that we could come to him with anything and everything in his power and to see him move in our lives and those around us. God never intended us for, for us to do this life alone and outside of his presence. This is why this parable encourages us to always pray, to not lose heart. You know, whether we're going through good times or bad times, we can always come to God, thanking him for who he is and all he has done. Whatever we're walking through, God calls us to prayer. And I love that his word is full of passages that help us to pray. And this is kind of, I said I was going to come to some practical tips. This is my main one. Go to the Bible. If you are struggling to discern the will of God, if you are struggling to put words to what is on your heart, come to the Bible. There are verses about everything in here. Anxiety, healing, praying for others to come to faith, everything that you can think of that's going on in your life, there is something in his word that will help you. And if you can't find it or you don't know it yourself, Google's a great tool. 
Google it. Um, <laughs> but even if you're like, I've quite often come to God and asked him for a verse. So if I, if I feel like God's calling me to pray for someone specific or a specific situation, I'll come to him and ask him to lead me to a verse in the Bible. And then I'll pray that over and for that person. It's powerful and it's effective because the word is God's revelation to us of his will and his character. So when we pray his word back to him, we're praying his heart. We've aligned with his heart and that's why it's so powerful. Another practical tip to keep us focused and also see the faithfulness of God in our life is to write it down. Write down what you're praying for. And then when God answers, whatever that answer is, write that down too and when it happens. So you can see the thread through your life of how God is working. And also then when you've been praying for something for 20 years, it's harder to forget. And it keeps you focused. God hasn't answered it. Going to keep on praying. And if you're not in the habit of praying regularly, like daily, multiple times a day, start small. Sometimes we come to these things and I can encourage you to pray and pray always and do all these things. You're like, I don't even know where to start. Like it can feel quite alien if you're not used to praying. But start small, small but regular, whether it's one or two minutes a day or multiple times a day, put it in your calendar, set alarms. You know, we see Daniel three times a day. He was on his knees. It was, it's almost ritualistic, but in that habit, in that process, God can just move so powerfully in your life and in those around us. And you can start to see the fruit happening. The more we pray, the more we see the hand of God move in our lives. You know, there's the, um, it's just come to mind that um, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't, you know, like some people are like, oh, it's just coincidence. Yeah. But if I don't pray about it. Um, yeah. The other way of getting like into the habit is actually there's some good Bible plans. Like go to you version, look up prayer. Like just get in there, learn the habit of prayer, learn the method of prayer. And the other thing is there's no right or wrong way. There is no right or wrong way to pray. It's just coming before God. You might sing, you might talk, you might literally just write it down. There are times and pages in my journal and it's literally my prayer. I'm just writing out my prayer and as I write, it flows. And it just helps those words come for me. All God wants is that conversation. It doesn't matter how it happens or where it happens. Every time you get in your car could be that reminder to pray. Every time you're, I don't know, putting the kettle on for another cup of coffee, pray. Like whatever it is that helps you just build that rhythm of prayer and come together as church. We pray twice a week as a church, Monday nights at 7 to 8 p.m., Friday morning, 6.30 a.m. on Zoom. They're great times of prayer. Come and join them. Being together in prayer helps build your faith, helps build you. It lets you see what God is doing in other people's lives so that you are built for faith in your own. It's powerful and it's effective. And if you still have questions, Nick and I, as we say every week, we love coffee. Just come have coffee with us. We'll talk prayer. Off the back of this um, parable in chapter Luke chapter 18, we find another parable, which I'll just very quickly touch on. And it's um, a parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector and how they're both praying. And they pray very differently. But the tax collector just comes before God and just says the words on his heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And God met him in that moment. And we see in this moment that Jesus is not interested in fancy words or particularly long prayers necessarily. He just wants raw, humble honesty from our heart to his. It's what we see in the widow and it's what God is looking for in us. Hungry, humble hearts who long to see the kingdom of God be seen on earth. And whether you've never prayed before or you've been praying for years, can I encourage you to do what this passage says? to always pray and not lose heart that when Jesus comes again, he will find faith on earth.